Good evening, good morning, good day, good afternoon, good whenever you happen to be watching this video. How are ya? Uh, it's B. Welcome back to yet another one of my many videos on, on historical, philosophical, psychological, and other subjects. And I wanted to change tack a little bit this time by talking about something that's both educational and political at the same time. And uh, that is the work of Paulo Freire, the Brazilian uh, 20th century uh, educationalist, teacher and theorist. And uh, I know whenever I say the words, <laughs> whenever I say the words political and education in the same the same point in time. There are a great number of, of teachers out there uh, who will probably go, ah, oh, that's it, out the room. I'm, you know, I don't want politics to get in the way of teaching. I don't think teaching should have any, have any political concepts within it at all. It's just about passing on uh, uh, the knowledge that, that children and adults need to the next generation. I want to do that. That's what I want to do. I don't want to teach know anything to do with your politics. And, uh, and, and uh, to a certain extent, I agree with you. Uh, and the reason why I agree with you is because, because at the end of the day, I think probably at the end, you, you do get bored a little bit when you think of politics of, of education as being something to do with the way policy is made in government. And that's not what this is about. This is not about me talking about whether uh, Conservative Party, Liberal Party, Democratic Party, Republican Party, Labour Party, or any other party is I'm not going to talk about how they make policy, educational policy. That's not the kind of politics I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is the social construction of politics and the way people think and act within society. And also the consequent inequalities that is a recognized part of the way society operates, both in the past when Freire was uh, alive and operating, and also in... Um, the whole business of, of the present day situation that we're in. Things have not changed very much. Uh, we may think that, you know, when Ferrer was first involved in all the, uh, uh, the business of talking about education and its discontents and its meaning within society, you may consider that that was maybe about a particular period in time when <laughs> the idea of of education as a kind of revolutionary process was kind of hot on the cards. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, but nothing much has changed. Only the colour of the flags has changed, but at the end of the day, the story is just the same. And I want to get you to that process by trying to get you to engage with some concepts about the way the world operates. We're currently in the middle of a pandemic, you may know that. And we're currently, this is, uh, uh, by the way, I kind of point out that I'm making this, this video in very late October of 2020, so the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is still going strong. We're currently heading into a what's often referred to as a second wave. Uh, lockdowns on the horizon, you know, the same old, same old we've had since February, March of this year. And uh, no doubt anybody who's re reading this or reading this, listening to this in five years' time may find all that quite amusing, or not. Or not. Or at least it's a historical document. But what I was about to say to you about all that is that in the process of doing that, of course, schools have closed. And in the process of, sc of schools closing, children have been at home, trying their very best to study via the internet and via contact with their teachers via distance learning. And some have done really well and some have not done very well at all. And the fundamental reason for that is not because they're stupid kids or unwilling or not enthusiastic about the business of finding themselves a, a, a niche within you know the social world of life, both now and in the future. But because at the end of the day, they just don't have the facilities. Uh, there is, it's pretty true, and has remained true, that not everybody within society has equal access to the internet. Not everybody in society has access to modern technologies, such as the kind of laptop I'm using right in the moment, or as the opportunity, for instance, to make use of it in a way that provides the best facilities. Everybody has got the internet, and if they do have the internet, maybe it's coming through not through you know domestic Wi-Fi systems with a with a, a good speed of broadband. Maybe it's coming through a mobile phone, 
And my mobile phones can be remarkable instruments. Uh, a small screen of, of this size, for instance, is not particularly a very useful one if you want to uh, do some, some work on a large scale. So there are issues of inequality within society, structured not because of the education system, but because of the inequalities which are economic and financial within society itself. Some have, and some have not. And this has a determining factor upon how students are able to learn and, and grow and develop within whatever educational structures we may have. It doesn't really matter much all that, all that which structures you have, because the same inequalities will exist. Suppose we just had a pure private education system. Suppose you have to but that was the case. Now we would still have inequalities. We would have to pay for education. Now those who had money would pay for the better education, and those who didn't would have to go for the bargain basement approach, as you might say. We seem to have tried to iron that out through a comprehensive educational system within countries across the world, which is free to everybody going to it. But not all schools are equal. Not all societies are equal. Not all educational systems are equal. In my time in teaching, I've understood that. I've had 36 years worth of teaching experience and, and engaged with a lot of people from various cultures. And one of the things I've learned very strongly is not all of us have equal access to the kind of facilities that we consider to be average, normal, every day, as we would expect to see in countries such as the UK, the USA, etc., etc. So what all this got to do with Paulo Ferreira? Well, when Paulo Ferreira first came to look at education, he uh, looked at it from the point of view of this seeking inequality. He was born into a society where he was, in his early early years, very, very poor indeed. And he said at the time that was, he didn't progress through education because he was stupid. He progressed through education badly because of the fact that he was hungry all the time. He literally had very little food, very little access to the kind of facilities that, that day-to-day -day students would, would expect. No free school meals, wink, wink, and therefore hadn't the capacity to be able to, to, to do the same sort of progress as other students had. And that hit him as an important aspect of educational truth, that if there is no access process in the economic sense, and it doesn't matter what kind of educational system you have, there will be inequalities in it. A secondary issue that's, that comes out of that is the kind of attitudes that are developed by the process of economy within the educational system. The idea that had been predominant right up until the work of, uh, I would suggest, John Dewey at the very least, was that there were two kinds of educational inmates, as you might say. Students, we call them these days, pupils. Children, or adults, or young people. That was the intelligent and the stupid, and that in all cases, children were unreal, unruly little creatures who had to be told to shut up, sit down, and be told things about the world. You want to see this in action in a kind of satirical comedy, very bleak comedy sort of way, then just look, look, look at Charles Dickens and, and his depiction of, 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 of teachers in the, you know, in the world of Thomas Gradgrind where teachers are seen as these authoritarian figures that tell you things about the world, like what a horse is, not what it does, how many teeth it's got, and so on and so forth. You can just look it up. Go and look it up. It's, it's, you'll get the idea straight away. This Victorian attitude to, to, to education is part and parcel of the process of access, the idea of, of dominance and subservience within the system itself, the process being that those who are coming along to be taught must be empty vessels, and the process of being empty vessels, they they needed to sit down and be filled. Where did the empty vessels idea came, come from? It came from, here's a good one, from the liberal ideas of John Locke. He perceived the human beings as being born as tabula rasa, empty vessels, blank slates, which the rest of society had to write upon. And hence it wasn't too far of a reach to understand that in the world of the hierarchy of burgeoning capitalism and the, and the development of industrial industrialization in in the early you know the 18th and 19th centuries that you get this concept of the idea of the blank slate being part and parcel of the educational system of the time and especially the educational system of the time which was not equal 
young children who came from lowly backgrounds were only educated up to the point where they became useful hands for, for work. All other children were seen as being suited to more education. You see some of this also in the work of Thomas Hardy and Judy Obscure, where Jude aspires to want to go to university, and the catastrophe that comes from all of that is about his aspiration and about the class divisions and the sense of impending doom that will come from the business of him trying to translate himself from one background into another through that division. Again, go and read it. You'll probably find that interesting too. Process of educational change, therefore, is wrapped up in economy. It's wrapped up in some fundamental concepts that have had to be resolved over a long period and have taken a lot of resolution. I would suggest they are still around because they become folk psychology. And one of them that still exists in the minds of teachers, educationists, politicians galore is something that Paolo referred to as the banking concept of learning and teaching. The banking concept is easy to understand. It goes like this. Children, and by definition all other learners, are empty vessels into which knowledge, skill, if you want to call it that, ability, will be poured. Who does that? The teacher. The teacher has all the knowledge capital, the skill capital, in the teaching environment. If you want to put plain, the teacher is a god striding upon the face of learning and knows everything. Or at least appears to. The children know nothing. Tabula rasa, remember? And especially those who come from humble backgrounds know even less. Therefore, they're like little empty containers in a bank into which the valuable information is deposited. The teacher comes along and makes deposits. And the process of making deposits expects the children to make best use of these valuable items that are deposited within them. It expects them, in some respects, to become part of the economic world around them through their these deposits, become functioning members of society in the role to which they are best fitted. This process became so inured in the teaching population that it still crops up today. I still hear. I heard a great deal during my time as uh, national president of the Institute for Learning. I still hear teachers say I was trying to drum it into their heads. And I kept thinking to myself, is, have none of you read Paulo Freire? Freire's critique was, this is totally the wrong concept of how not only learning works, but also how children engage with the business of learning. All children are capable of learning to one extent or another, limited by their physical factors. You know, if they have special, specific learning needs, that kind of skews their playing field slightly. But by and large, can they are able to learn. And they do it not by the business of having anything deposited inside them, because, let's face it, that's not possible. What they do is engage with the world around them. The process of that engagement, that business of talking to others, talking to their fellow students, talking to their teachers, being part of a situation in which they will learn through experience and through the business of, 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 of talking, discussion, critique, analysis, thinking through things, experimenting, getting results from the business of their experimentation, internalizing this through their behavior and the process of being in, in, in a constant a, a state of developing through these gaps within their knowledge, something that, that, that you, you often find it in, in, in work, the work of Vygotsky, for instance, this idea of the zone of proximal development, you know, between what the student knows now and what the student will, you know, should or could or will know sometime in the future. That gap is where the learning takes place. That engagement in that gap is the most important, important thing. No student ever comes to learning as a blank slate. All bring with them something, and most notably what they bring with them, especially when they're children, is the stuff they've learned through their play, through the business of being brought up, through being children outside the school environment, through
for the business of the things they've learned as part and parcel of their day-to-day -day engagement with everybody else around them. The language they speak, the words they use, the cultural terminology and the ideas they bring with them and so on. No child comes to a system without a whole package of, of possibility built into them. Frere recognized this. He said in the process of doing that, children were as good at teaching as they were at learning. For him, everyone teaches, everyone learns. The process of learning is not, I know everything, you know nothing, but it's a process of exchange. It's, the word engagement is going to come up again, so I'm going to use it. It's a process of engagement. But what do I mean by engagement? The idea being you listening to what I'm saying right now and probably wanted to ask me questions and can't because it's a, it's a video. And that, if I was to stop and I was teaching this live, the idea would be we would have a long discussion about all that and about our own previous experiences as of being learners or students in our own right. And the process of doing that shows and demonstrates what engagement is. The learning is in the engagement. It's not in pouring stuff into the heads of small children. To ask a child to remember something is one thing. To ask a child to make use of it is another. And the use of it is what the learning is all about. Freire understood that. He therefore took one step further, and this is the one that most teachers balk at. He said that learning by its very nature is political. The nature of engagement is political because it's about this business of the stress, the tensions between those who own knowledge capital in itself and those who don't. And it's the struggle between getting to know things and making use of them in society and between those who would rather you didn't know as opposed to knowing or not obliging people by knowing your place but in fact struggling against knowing your place that is part and parcel of the business of learning. If you don't understand that, you don't understand learning. And in many respects, Freire's view that in fact that whole Total whole systems, that total systems approach to learning is part and parcel of his very philosophy in itself. The very idea that learning is a whole system is a Freirean one. His idea that somehow in the, by learning one is engaging in a struggle and the tensions of society. Whenever I teach philosophy, it's like that. You know, we come up with some really thorny, problematic ideas and we struggle with them, we struggle with them to try to understand them and the process of understanding them, we're learning. It's not in trying to grasp the entire idea itself that's the important thing. It's the struggle to do so where the learning takes place. It's in that movement from let's engage with this idea that we get the learning process. And the more we do it, the better we get at it, as children understand. The more they're praised and supported in the business of extending their own learning on a personal level in collaboration with others within their groups. The more they get better at doing it, the better they are at doing it, the more they want it, and the more they want it, the better they get. It becomes a cascade of possibility within the learning environment, and I think this is one of the most important aspects that the school systems that we've got, and also society as a whole, can learn. Learning doesn't happen just in schools. Learning happens wherever you happen to be, including this talk I'm giving, and all the little peripheral stuff around it and the discussions you may have with your partner or friends or whatever about this self sub sub same subject all the discussions you might have with other teachers if you happen to be a teacher and all those other processes in itself are where the learning works it's in the engagement that the learning works not in the individual mind forget about that Freire, by his nature is controversial he has a provocative impact upon governmental power because his very ideas provoke a struggle about power. It's about the business of learning how the world wags and who's wagging it, to quote T.H. White. This is about that process. The more you need you know, and the more you end up needing to know. And the problem with the problem with that is it changes you as an individual often called the educating reader effect. It's a good term. 
go and watch the movie. The process of change in that sense is a vital aspect of societal change. Learning isn't just about learning a skill that you can find a job with. That's sort of like minor aspect of it. It's important, yes, but it's not the thing. The thing is, by being part of society, you have to be take part in it. And learning has to be part and parcel of the business of taking part in society. Otherwise, we become drones, only fit for jobs, only fit for 2.5 children, a mortgage, a car, and dying at the age of 75, 80, whatever. That's all we become. Our lives become belittled unless we have that opportunity to engage. And that is Paolo Freire's message. Going go and read his book. He wrote a book in the early 60s called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Go and read it. It's a quite straightforward read. Uh, he pulls no punches. He's critical of the banking method, the banking concept of education. He applies his work in the process of 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 of, of uh, practice in education and, and, and ways of educating and whole new ways of thinking about what learning is. His work is extremely important in, in the theory of learning. His work led on to the work of Jean Leif and Etienne Wenger in the 19, uh, late 1980s, early 1990s, which provided the framework for, for, for things like situated learning. There's a very strong relationship with in, between situated learning and Paulo Freire's work. Learning by its nature is a revolutionary act. You don't have to be Che Guevara to understand that. All of us, as teachers, have a responsibility to understand the importance of that very process. And I would suggest if you don't, you're missing something. Something which is essential to you and your self-respect as a teacher and the actual meaning of the job itself. That process can change organisations, change institutions, and change society, but only through engaging in it can we have, and there's the word engagement again, can we have the learning that we have to have as teachers. Remember, everyone teaches and everyone learns in order to be able to progress further and make educational work something that's liberative. Freire believed in education as liberation. So do I, you probably guessed. And at that point, I want to end this video. Please go away and have a further look at the work of Freire, his, his works, and so on. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. I'm, I'm Brazilian, you know, is, is non-existent. I'm a Portuguese, right? Non non-existent. So, you know, uh, don't, don't shoot the messenger. Go and take a look at his work. I'm sure you'll find it inspiring and interesting. And he's very, very relevant today in the light of recent events within society and the way in which we conceive of ourselves in a neoliberal world, as you might say, in the early 21st century. Thank you for listening yet again. I do appreciate the fact you spent your time listening to these things, and I look forward to speaking to you again. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>